given me a message. Um, I want God to do whatever he feels like doing, but I, I feel in my spirit like it's going to be uh, a, a teaching uh, moment this morning, attitude, and there are times for that. There are times for that. Tonight I'm going to preach, I already feel what God has laid on my heart for the evening service, and I'm going to talk tonight about spiritual consistency. Spiritual consistency. It's easy to swing from the chandeliers, as they say, and be hyped up in the spirit of the moment, but it's another to serve God Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, for 365 days a year and do it for a full lifetime and just be faithful. And just be faithful. We're going to talk about that tonight. Joshua 24, verse 14, King James. Now, therefore, Joshua says, fear the Lord and Serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt. And serve ye the Lord. He repeats himself. Verse 15. And if it seem evil to you to serve the Lord, then choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood... Or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You've heard a multitude of messages preached from this setting of Scripture by pastor, by myself, by evangelists, other pastors and teachers. And today I feel like God has shown me something brand new from this setting of scripture that I want to share with you and it's actually not in 15 which is where we usually put the emphasis choose you this day and that's that's important make your decision but if you already feel like you've made your decision then in verse 14 Joshua gives a four part system for making that choice successful number one fear the Lord number two Serve him in sincerity and truth. Number three, put away the gods of the past. And number four, he repeats, serve the Lord. And that's the spiritual consistency part that we're going to talk about tonight. And this morning, with the help of the Holy Ghost, I want to teach on this topic, the pieces of a puzzle called choice. The pieces of a puzzle called choice. Would you pray with me right now that the Lord will use his word to make us better. Lift your voice, your heart, your minds, your hands, however you want to do it right now. But ask that God would take his word and shape us and form us on his potter's wheel and make us such that when we leave this place, we are better than the way we walked in. And let the people say in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Greet someone nearby you there, the seat next to you or behind you, in front of you. Welcome them to the house of the Lord. Have some exciting news before I proceed with the message. On Sunday, two couple pieces of news. On two weeks from today, the 23rd. We will have Brother Billy Cochran from Charlotte here with us. Yes, sir. I apologize. Brother Cochran, we like you too, if you see this later on the stream. But you're not coming on the 23rd. Brother Scott Hall is. Brother Scott Hall is incredible. He has an awesome testimony. You just got to hear him talk about how he used to be a drug-pushing hippie. And how God has turned him around into the man of God that he is today. It's an awesome testimony. He'll be here with us on June the 23rd. On June the 30th, that morning at 9 a.m., we will start our brand new discipleship series here in this church. I'm thrilled about it. Um, And then we will, after, just so that you know, on the, the new service schedule, and we're going to go ahead and pass out all the cards that we already have, and then when we print the new cards, uh, it'll reflect uh, the new service start time. But we'll have that service at 9 o'clock, and then we'll break around 9.45, 10, and then the 
morning worship service will begin around 10, 15, 10, 20. So that'll be the new service schedule. If you can make it on Sunday mornings at 9, we'd love to have you. I want you to know what this course is going to be about. If you thought it was going to be just about the foundation building blocks of the salvation message, as in repenting of sin, being baptized in the name of Jesus, filled with the Holy Ghost, evidenced by speaking with other tongues. If you thought that's all it was, you are mistaken. That's just a piece and a part of it. And the first three lessons are about that. And we actually are not even going to start in lesson three because everybody that we currently have at the moment has a good, solid understanding of baptism in the name of Jesus and being filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. And if we have visitors that come in after that time, we'll give them home Bible study and we'll teach them. But we're going to go right into lesson four of the series. And as we proceed forth, we'll cover topics such as prayer, how to pray, what to pray, ways to structure your prayer. We'll cover tithing, offering. We'll cover stewardship of your finances in your own life from a biblical perspective. I'm talking about setting money aside for your house payment, your car payment, and all the right things you should do instead of wasting money and blowing it and not having it in the end. We'll talk about all these things from a biblical perspective. We'll talk about fasting. We'll talk about our thoughts, our minds, we'll talk about inward holiness, outward holiness. It's a great, great lesson series of discipleship on making you and I stronger members in the church of the Almighty God. I invite you, it'll be on Sunday mornings, if I'm the one preaching the main sermon of the day uh, after the worship service, Pastor will most likely teach the lesson at 9. And if Pastor is teaching the main lesson of the day after the worship service, I will most likely teach the class at 9. And I've also had Sam volunteer to help me out. Uh, if Pastor and I ever get to go out of town together again, hint, hint, I'm ready for you to take me to Disney World again, Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a man sitting behind. Hey, shoot him a text during service, Brother Bill Kerber, that you'd like to go to Disney World also. By the way, I left my cell phone downstairs today just in case. So that will begin. I didn't drop my water. It's good. That was something else. We're good. I will. We will begin that on June the 30th. So that's very exciting. On It does sound good. Um, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. And I'm wrong all the time, and I've just gotten used to it. I'm wrong all the time. But if I'm wrong on this, you, you can tell me later. But there's uh, kind of a lazy spirit going on in the service this morning. I don't know if it's because you didn't get up early enough or because you forgot who Jesus was or you don't know who I am at this point, but this is church. Yeah, and you need to be happy. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to preach this morning unless God instructs me to do so. I just feel like teaching, but I, this, one, this one's a freebie. Part of being able to serve God consistently is to be happy while you're doing it. You got to, you, bad things are going to happen, but you got to smile that you got to keep on your face in order to make it on over to the other side. Amen. All of you got things going on. Who among, if you don't currently have any issues going on in your life, would you please raise your hand? Fantastic. I'd like to meet with you after service and find out what your secret is. Uh, because the rest of us do. The rest of us do. And you know what it's called? It starts with an L and it ends in IF. We all go through it. That's not what I came to preach about this morning. But tonight I'll, t I'll touch on it because we as a people, as a, an individual church, and as the church need to understand some consistency in our relationship with God because, you know, it's easy to get caught up in the heat of a moment and going crazy in a song. And the next service, you can't even lift your hands and worship. You got to keep it real during the week. You got to pray and fast and read your Bible and talk to God during your week. Amen. And that goes along with what I'm going to talk about right now. Choice. The pieces of a puzzle called choice. Choice, like your perception is everything. It's ingrained in all that we do in every moment of every day. Choices are always done in the immediacy of now. I preached to you earlier in the month, you can't undo choices of the past. You can try and make up for those 
You can try to correct them by doing other good things, but you will never be able to go back in time and remake that choice. Speaking of the future, I heard it once said, tell God your plans and watch Him smile. Things never turn out the way we think they are going to turn out. You can make your plans for tomorrow about the choice you think you'll make tomorrow, but until you get in that moment, you don't know what you'll do. And I will say that your tomorrow will eventually become your today. And then and only then is when the choice will be made. Lately, the topic of service, service to the Lord, has been first and preeminent in my heart. Without an understanding of service, you and I are incomplete in our relationship with God. As I've recently discussed privately with many of you on separate occasions over the past few weeks, there's a great difference between doing what you're told and serving because it's in your heart, in your heart to do so. And I believe that in this message that Joshua delivered to a nation before they were to cross over the Jordan into a place called the promised land. As he gives this kind of final word, look, if you want to serve these other gods that aren't even real, just stay over here and don't go with us across the Jordan. But you need to make your choice this day who you're going to serve. I believe that as he delivered this message, his mind was probably on the same subject, that going through the motions of just doing what somebody told you to do is not the same thing as serving the Lord because you've got an intense desire in the depth of your heart to do so. It's not the same thing. I'm young in years, but I've been a part of the apostolic message all my life, and I believe that this one immutable component of a life in Christ is going to separate people that make it, people that stay, people that sink roots in the church and the people that just stay in what I call the revolving door system. They're in, they're out, they're in, they're out, they're in, they're out. And if the time that they're in just happens to be the day the Lord returns, then good for them. But none of us know when God's coming back. None of us know the day or the hour. If you've ever been a part of that revolving door system in your life, and I'm not even talking about being outside of the church. I'm talking about sitting on a church pew. Showing up to services, but the word not changing you. Being in a worship service, but not worshiping. Coming to a prayer service. I said I wasn't going to preach, but I feel it. Coming to a prayer service and not praying. You're part of that spiritual revolving door system. Can I tell you if it's worth the time to set the alarm clock, to roll out of bed and get up and come to church, then make the best of it while you're here. If it's worth the time to put gas in the tank and make the drive to be here, then sing in the worship service. Lift your hands up and give God some praise. I lied. I apologize. Forgive me, God. I repent. I said I wasn't going to preach. I'm preaching. (laughs) That one immutable component that will separate those who make it and those who fall away spiritually is the heart of a servant. The life of a servant separates you from the great power that constantly tries to grip the heart of your humanity. It is this thing, the polar opposite of the heart of a servant. And that thing, that one thing that ruins all mankind, That one thing that started in the garden. That one thing that can ruin you and you and me and you and you and me again is selfishness. Selfishness will cause you to not want to pray. Selfishness will cause you to not want to fast. I had a man tell me on the phone yesterday that for the first time in almost 12 years of serving the Lord on Friday... For the first time in his life, he fasted and prayed for a full day. Before you point fingers and judge and say, he's been in church 12 years and he's never fasted a day, I challenge you to look back at your own spiritual life over the last few months and count the number of times you have fasted a full day. And I ain't talking about you fast every night from 10 p.m. to 8 a.m. That don't count. That don't count. That's called sleep. But 
look at your own life and think about the last time it was you went to work and had to lift stuff or think or shuffle papers or make phone calls or do whatever it is you do at work while your head was thumping just a little bit and your mind was saying, mm, mm, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. And those of you that fast, is it just me or is it that on the day that you don't fast, you, it seems like you can go to 10 or 11 o'clock working and it's no problem. You don't even think about food. But when fast day gets there, baby, when that alarm goes off at 8.01, ooh, I'm hungry. You know what that is? That's your flesh. Your body, your humanity is selfish by its nature. I want to be like you, God, so I'm going to do what you told me not to do. I'm going to eat of that fruit. That's where it all started. Guys, don't blame the women. You took, you took the fruit too. It's, it's in every one of us. It's in every one of us. And this man told me, he said, Pastor Bart, I called you because we started our conversation on other things. And he said, I want you to know the real reason I called you was to tell you how awesome I feel right now. This was yesterday afternoon. I said, what do you mean? He said, I feel closer to God than I have ever felt in my entire life. He said, I feel a peace that I've never felt before. He said, I feel a connection to the Word of God. I feel like I want to go higher in my spiritual life than I've ever gone before. I want to go to a new height in my relationship with God that I never really cared about before. And I told him on the phone, I said, Brother, you think one day is awesome? Think about when it's going to be when you turn around a month from now and you fasted every Friday of the month. And you turn around six months and you've been fasting every Friday for six months and a year from... You and me trying to get closer to that thing called a relationship with God. It's you and I conquering that selfishness and having the heart of a servant. Many of you are looking at me strange because you've never fasted. You don't know what it means. You don't know what it is. What in the world does food have to do with God? I tell you what it has to do with God. When you can conquer your body's desires, you'll conquer your mind's desires. When you can learn to conquer what you're selfish body wants to do you'll be able to conquer what's going on up here and you'll start thinking different about church time you'll start thinking different about getting there early about showing up to prayer about being a part of everything going on and i feel like joshua may have had all of these things in his heart when he talked to the people that day and he said point number one fear the lord what does that mean this is the first puzzle piece Joshua mentions. It is the foundation of a, relation, of a relationship with God. To me, the most important part and the part that most of our society lacks today because it is so filled up with other things. We are a blessed nation. We are a blessed people. But what does that fear of the Lord mean? Does that mean literally that you're afraid of the God that you serve, that you look up? Ah, no, that's not what the word meant here in the original Hebrew and Old English. What this literally means here, the fear of the Lord is the awe of the Lord. It is to be in amazement of who He is. The fear of the Lord is to be in absolute wonder at His perfection. It is a healthy respect for God's office, for His position as Lord of all creation, for His eminence, for His ultimate and incomparable power. That is the fear of the Lord. Psalm 111, 10, the fear, the awe of the Lord is just the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do His commandments, His praise endureth forever. Proverbs 1, 7, the grandson speaks. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. The instruction that we're given here that he's talking about is this extreme respect of who God is. And it becomes a part of us. And so that everything else we build on our relationship with him starts from that point. This is the piece that's missing. And where popular organized religion in Western society has failed. We are blessed in the part of the world that we live in. We have everything. We want for nothing. But God's image has been transformed from one of 
ultimate power in the universe to security blanket. Fuzzy teddy bear that does nothing but make us feel better. And do not misquote me and anyone listening, continue on the internet and finish the thought train with me. While God does make us feel better, that is not the ultimate summation of who God is. God existed before you and I were around to need to be made to feel better. He is God. Awesome. Terrible. Mighty. Majesty. Powerful. Ultimate. He should not be relegated to the position of backup plan or consigned to the escape clause that you've designed in your spiritual contract with Him. He should not be the just-in-case contingency plan or the stored away and dusty crutch that you've got just in case you get hurt. You should serve God all the time. Because of who he is, because of the fear of the Lord, because of the splendor and the majesty of who you know that he is. He is God. Joshua says, fear the Lord, be in awe of him, respect the Lord, honor the Lord, give him. If you were to translate it directly from the Hebrew into our modern English, give him incredible moral reverence. When you and I come in and sing what I call the angel song. What is that? John was in his revelation. He said, I heard, as it were, the voice of many waters. as of the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. And he talks about their song. And he says that they sing, Holy, 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 Lord God, Holy, which was and is and is to come. And you know what John said? He said they sing it and they rest not day and night. I heard Brother Booker preach about this. What does it mean to think about the fact that millions upon millions and millions of angels since before there was time, Brandon, have been shouting out, what must that crowd sound like? John said it was like thunderings, like the voice of many waters. How many of you like the beach? You ever heard those ocean waves crash when the tide starts to come? Fear of the Lord. Number one, you and I must have that incredible, supreme, moral reverence for who he is. Number two, serve him in sincerity and truth. It's interesting the words that Joshua used here. Because if you didn't know, Joshua can be thought of as a type and a foreshadowing of Christ. His very name, Yeshua, is the phonetic foundation of the name you and I know as Jesus. Look at his life. He leads the people from their pasts, who they used to be, across a river where they get washed and get a new heart, a spirit, in a place called the promised land. What is it that God in flesh designed to happen? But he would come down and take us from who we used to be across a thing called repentance and baptism, washing us from who we used to be and giving us his spirit of the Holy Ghost. And he's promised that he's prepared a place for us called heaven. If that's not the promised land, I don't know what is. Look at his life. He succeeds the life of Moses. He takes over and In the same fashion, God in flesh, Jesus Christ, succeeded in conquering the law to give you and I liberty from sin. So Joshua says to serve. Pastor, this is what I feel like God showed me today for the first time. And if he's already shown you this before, don't tell me because I felt really special because I felt like this was a first. Just don't tell me. Did you know it takes more calories to smile than it does to frown? Fact. So I have a challenge. Don't preach or exhale when you do it because you might knock somebody out. It's Sunday morning. But look at your neighbor and just go. Come on, do it, Rose. Do it, Rose! It feels good to smile, folks. There's joy in here. 
So Joshua is a type and a foreshadowing. And Joshua, after <laughs> Matthew Rodriguez is saying, Phew, if you were sitting by Kenneth Taylor, do you think you could smile? I feel, I feel that coming from it. I feel what you're saying, Brother Matthew Rodriguez. I've been going through it for years. Mike Potter's been saying it for forever. Try smile, Holy Ghost. Try smiling on the front row there. He first says, fear the Lord. And look what he says, part number two. Can y'all hang with me? I've only got like three bullets. We're already on number two. They'll still be serving breakfast at the Cracker Barrel. Here it is. Here it goes. Here it goes. Joshua said, fear the Lord. Serve him in sincerity and truth, right? John four nineteen. A woman says to Jesus, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers used to worship in this mountain. She was a Samaritan woman. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. But you say that Jerusalem is the place where we ought to worship. Jesus says, woman, believe me, the hour's coming when you're not going to worship in this mountain or in Jerusalem. Verse 22, you're worshipping something that you don't even understand. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Verse 23, and the hour cometh, and now is... When the true worshipers shall worship the Father in sincerity and in truth. In spirit and in truth. For the first time I made a connection here with what God was saying. A lawyer looked at God one day and he said, What are the two most important commandments? Thou shalt serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy mind. And love your neighbor like yourself. What was the first one? Fear. Worship Him in spirit. What is spirit but sincerity and in truth? For the Father seeketh. You know why He could look at that woman and say, Lady, the hour's coming when it won't matter if it's this mountain or if it's a city called Jerusalem. God doesn't want a city. He wants hearts and minds. He wants sincerity and truth from you. He wants the heart of a servant right up here. Number one, fear the Lord, respect Him, be in awe of Him. But number two, be sincere with Him. Give your heart to Him. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit. They that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. When Kandasi, the queen of Ethiopia, came to visit Solomon, this is what she had to say in Second Chronicles chapter 9, verse 5. She said to the king, It was a true report which I heard in my own land about your words and your wisdom. Verse 6, however, I did not believe their words until I came and saw with my own eyes. And indeed, the half of the greatness of your wisdom was not told to me. You exceed the fame which I heard. Verse 7. Happy are your men and happy are your servants who stand continually before you and hear your wisdom. This second piece, sincerity and truth, is all about the heart of a servant. Being sincere, being honest, being truthful, being full of integrity, With him, that's what means everything to God. He wants that from you above anything else. I've preached to you as I do again right now. God is not after roboticism. He doesn't want canned actions or just the motions of being apostolic. And may I say that you can try to look and act the part But God always knows what's going on on the inside. You may snow your family. You may pull one over on your pastor every now and again. Not often. He sees stuff. He knows stuff. But you're not going to fool God. God knows. Fear the Lord. Serve Him in sincerity and in truth. Number three, put away the idols of the past. In this instance... At that point in time, Joshua was very literally speaking of statues, coins, talismans, groves, altars, little wooden forms set on their hearths. 
idols of worship and sacrifice to false gods. But this morning, and in our modern world, our lives in general, I don't foresee an issue that any of you are going to have a problem with these little forms and statues and talismans and coins and groves and altars that you and shrines that you build in your basement to some untrue, fake, made up God. I don't think that's going to be an issue for us. But you know what? We all have served our gods. Little G. There's only one big G. There's only one true God. But we've all served our little gods. It wasn't a statue. It wasn't a shrine. It wasn't an altar. It wasn't a grove. But you've served your gods. I've served mine. We're all human. Lewd entertainment. Unhealthy relationships. Sinful media that you wouldn't view if Jesus was there. My wife and I have talked about that a lot in our own lives. We're not going to have that stuff in our house. It's not going to have it. Self-serving hobbies, ungodly people, filthy speech, unrighteous places, all manner of other things in this modern world can easily become the little G gods that we serve. Idol worship is simply anything that takes your absolute focus off of His Majesty, the King. Matthew 4, verse 8. Again, Everybody say again. Again. Look at your neighbor and say again. Again. Let's pause right here. This is another freebie. You ready for another freebie? Say again. Again. Can I tell you that the devil is not done tempting you? Look at your neighbor and say again. again. Can I tell you you're not done fighting for your spirituality? Tell somebody new again. There's a point that the writer, there's a reason the writer included this word again. The devil. Don't look at your neighbor when I say the devil. Just when you say again. Again the devil takes him up. Again the devil takes him up to an exceeding high mountain and shows him all the gods with the little g. The kingdoms of the world. The glory of men. And the devil says in his idiocy to the master of all creation. (laughs) He didn't know who he was talking to. I'll give all this to you. Yes, you are. If you'll just fall down and worship me. And Jesus says. Back up buddy. For thou shalt worship. The Lord thy God. And him only shalt thou serve. Can I tell you something? (laughs) Satan didn't even understand what Jesus was looking at him and saying. But what Jesus was looking at him and saying. Hey buddy. I'm not going to worship you. You get down on your knees and worship me. Because I'm God. Woo. The great I am. Jesus said I am. Before Abraham was. I am. Fear the Lord. Serve him in sincerity and truth. In spirit and truth. Put away idols. Put away the gods that your father served. That were on the other side of the flood. And choose you this day. Whom you will serve. Matthew 6, 20, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And if you lay them up there, moths and rust won't destroy the way that thieves break in and steal things down here. For where your treasure is. Serve him in sincerity and truth. Put away God's. Put away idol worship from your life. Verse 24. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other. There is no middle ground. Or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and flesh. You cannot serve God and flesh. You cannot serve God and have idols in your life. You cannot serve God and have other little gods in your life distracting you from the awe, the moral reverence, the fear of the Lord. Those things that keep you from serving Him in sincerity and truth. Put away, put away, 
put away. Somebody say it. Put away. Put away away those gods. Pastor preached a couple of weeks ago. If God be God, then let's serve him. You all remember that message? And I was reminded of 1 Kings 18, 21, New Jerusalem Bible. Elijah stepped out in front of all the people and said, How long, he said, do you mean to hobble first on one leg and then on the other? If Yahweh is God, then follow him. And if Baal is God, then follow him. But the people had nothing to say. You know why? They were Humpty Dumpty. They were on the fence. They were on the fence. They had nothing to say. Why will you hobble? How long will you hobble on one leg and then hobble on the other? I've come to just tell this church today, if there's any little inkling in your mind of a backup plan, destroy it. If you've got any kind of a fleshly, carnal, idol bridge in your life, burn it so there's no way back. Get it out of your life and make your decision. I will serve the Lord. Amen. I hear you, Adeline. (laughs) Let there be no next time in your walk with God. Make this time the only time. And I'm not saying you won't make mistakes. I'll just go ahead and let you be rest assured of of a fact. You will make mistakes. I'm talking about going back on God. I'm talking about losing that fear, that ultimate moral reverence of who He is, that vision of the sight of the power and majesty of God. Don't ever lose that. Don't ever get in a comfort zone to where you can't honor Him, to where you can't ever just melt and do this right here. Don't ever get to a place where you're too good to lift your hands Girls, don't ever get to a place where your hair looks too pretty to shout down a little bit. Guys, don't ever be so secure in your tie and shirt that you can't just pull it off and just give God some glory. God wants sincerity and truth. Sincerity and truth. Put away. Put away the false gods. What I mean here, not that you won't make mistakes. Make this time the only time. Let there be no next time. Joshua said... Make up your mind. And then the last fourth point, which we're going to hit tonight, he goes again. Serve the Lord. It's kind of like an extra that he adds on. Can we go to to that right now, gentlemen? In Joshua 24, I believe it's verse 14. Look what he says. Consistent. Be consistent. Be consistent. Be consistent. Serve Him every day, all day. Serve the Lord. Serve the Lord. Serve the Lord. How do you keep those things fresh in your mind? How do, how, how do you become consistent? We'll talk some about it tonight, but we're going to hit it a lot in this upcoming discipleship series starting on the 30th. Folks, folks, saints, you've heard me preach it, you've heard Pastor preach it. You've heard evangelists, pastors, and other teachers come here and preach it when they didn't know we had preached it. Pray. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray. I I cannot repeat this enough because some of you, I, I want you to get it. I want you to get it the way God helped me to get it. Prayer will do everything. Prayer moves mountains. Prayer moves mountains. We need fasting. We need Bible reading. These things will help you to do this point number four, serve the Lord. First Peter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh, he was able to stop sinning. That's what that means. Can I tell you that heaven is not your goal? I heard a man say this at East Coast Conference years ago. Heaven's not your goal. It's your promise to be like Jesus is your goal. There's strength in that. Quit making your focus. I want to make it to heaven. 
Go past that. Go past that. I want to be more like Jesus. Because if you can be more like Jesus, heaven's not going to be an issue. Bring your flesh, your mind, your body, your thoughts, your hopes, your dreams, your desires, and bring it all into subjection under the power of His majesty, the King. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. You can do it too, is what he's saying here. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but rather for the will of God. Verse 3, for we have spent enough of our past lifetime. How much time have we each wasted in sin? How much time have we each wasted Serving these little G gods. In doing the will of the Gentiles. When we talked in lewdness, lusts, drunkenness, revelries, parties, and abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it's strange that you don't hang out with them. Run with them in the same flood of dissipation. And they speak evil of you because of it. If no one's talked about you yet, they will. Get ready for it. It's just going to happen. But that's not why you're serving God, right? You're not serving God for people, are you? Why? Because people make mistakes. People are frail. People are full of error. We don't serve God for people. We serve God for God. For six, for this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead. That's when Jesus went down, remember? That they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. Verse 7, and here's the real thing we need to focus on. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. 2 Corinthians 6, 2. For he saith, I have heard thee, God says, in a time accepted. And in the day of salvation, I've succored thee or taken care of you. I've raised you. Now is the accepted time, God says. Behold, now is the day of salvation. I almost applied the title to this lesson. Today is always the right time. And it, and it would have worked. But I didn't want the focus to be off these components of fear of the Lord. These puzzle pieces of this thing called choice. Choice, 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 choice. The fear of the Lord. Serve Him with sincerity and truth. Three, put away. Thank you for listening. Put away those gods. Put away those idols. And as a general reminder, serve the Lord consistency make up your mind be happy and secure in your decision have the heart of a servant for now for once for always fear the Lord be in awe of him serve him with that spirit of sincerity that spirit of truth for the father seeketh such discard those old idols those gods those distractions and I preached to you the last time I preached leave the past in the past yesterday is not ours to recover but tomorrow is ours to win or lose serve the Lord Colossians 3 23 and whatsoever ye do you know what the word heartily here translates to with everything that's in you with fullness with 100% effort. Do heartily and do it for the Lord. Your service to God is exactly that. Service to God. It's not for any person. It's not for a pastor. It's not for an assistant pastor. It's for God. It's for God. It's for God. This is my last note and then a scripture. You remember what Kandasi, the queen of Ethiopia, said? How happy are your, are your men? And look at the smiles on your servants. 
I had not even heard the half of it. Here's the point. Make all this totally about Him and do it with a smile on your face. I want to leave you with Psalm 25. Let's all stand together. Psalm 25. I'll have it up here behind me if you don't have your Bible. Verse 1. David says, Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul, who I am inside. Verse 2. O oh my God, I trust in Thee. Let me not be ashamed. And don't let my enemies triumph over me. Verse 3. Yes. Let nobody that waits on You be ashamed. Let none that wait on Thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed with which transgress without cause. Verse 4. Show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. Verse 5. Lead me in thy truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. And on thee do I wait all the day I'll leave you with this I preached to you about the pieces of a puzzle called choice every component of your relationship with God every piece of your daily walk with him is choice is choice make the decision to have the heart of a servant would you lift hearts and minds, voices, hands to heaven right now? And I want us to pray down the spirit of the servant upon this church. Pray with me right now that God would let the spirit of the servant descend on your own life. Pray with me right now that God would let the spirit of the servant fall into your household onto you your wife your husband your babies your children pray right now that the heart of a servant would grip this church so strongly and our prayer becomes more fervent and fiery than ever before that when we lift our hands it's not homoticism or because a pastor had to remind us to but because of sincerity
Challenge you to raise your hands and sing it to I'll him. Serve the Lord through the good and through the bad. I'll serve the Lord. I'll serve the Lord for it's an honor to be had. There's no greater honor. worthy of it, isn't he? Thank you, Lord, for your word today. Thank you for the reminder. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace and mercy extended to us. Thank you for sending your servant, Pastor Bart, to preach to us the word of God today. It seems to me of late, the Holy Spirit is working on reminding and reviving us that what we do is for Him. This lesson today about fearing the Lord and on number two note, He told me not to say it, but I do want to say it. John chapter 4, verse 23. For the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in sincerity and in truth was a first for me. I wanted to pick at him and say, oh, I've known that for years. He didn't give me the opportunity. I was waiting on it and he didn't give it to me. But the truth was it was a first for me. I served the Lord with sincerity. And so I feel like the Holy Spirit is working on reminding us that what we do is for him. And since it's for him, do it and live it with sincerity. And then the reminder of putting away the idols of the past. And then the last note, which he said he's going to preach about tonight to us. I'm anxious about that. Serve the Lord. Serve the Lord. It's interesting also that several times in the last few services, I've heard Colossians chapter 3 and verse 23 quoted. He had no way of knowing On my way to church this morning, first I didn't know what he was going to preach to us. And I sent my dear friend, Brother Martin Ballestero, a message. I want to share the message with you that I sent him. Good morning. Lynn and I are driving. We're talking about friends. I was reminiscing. I called two friends of mine this morning that God has added to my life, both of which were Brother Billy Cochran and Brother Scott Hall. I thought of all the people I've known as I've pastored through the years. Many of them have heard bad things about me and my family. 
a handful have stayed in my life and even remained, but even with caution. And I looked at her and I said, but you know something? I know one man who has loved me and my family and our church through it all, and that's Brother Martin Ballestero. He's been a friend through gossip and slander and much heartache. So I just wanted to say to you, thank you. And just so you know, many times pastors have brought up your name and I said, I don't understand why it would be so hard for all these churches, including ours, to give $1,000 as a group and buy him a brand new car and a new motor home to travel the country in. So easy. And so that's the least we can do. So, from my heart, I want to buy you a new motorhome and a new truck. I can't do it by myself. I'm going to need help. So, since I can't do it by myself, just consider this when you're finished preaching, please come and retire in Archdale. Anyway, you're the best friend I've ever had. Through the years, as Kenny Rogers said, you never let me down. You turned my life around, and I'm so glad you stayed right here with me through the years. I love you more than I have words to say. Thank you for being a rock, a leader, and a man of God, and for never giving up on all of us. And Brother Ballestero, Remember the words of the Apostle Paul, whatsoever you do, do heartily as to him, and not unto men, for of him you shall reap the reward. He texted me back really quick and said, wow, you made me cry. That has to be the nicest thing a man can ever hear from a friend. I'd like to call you later today. Anyway. I was feeling nostalgic. Pastor Bart, thank you for the word. Whatever you do, saints of God, whatever you do, do it to the Lord. If you get that, living for God is a breeze. Because whatever you do, you know you're doing it for Him. And living for God then becomes fun and joyful and happy and exciting. Because you're interested in serving him. Thank you, Pastor Atkins, for the word today. Do we think?